Uh, that should be enough. Um, we've probably got a few more people coming in, um, but no, I guess they can catch up and watch the video later. Uh, welcome, welcome to Recharge the Chain Part 2. Um, this is all about Scotland's ambition and capability in the electric assisted vehicle and cycle supply chain. Thanks for taking the time this morning to be here. Um, yeah, I think it'll be worth your while and hopefully you gain some value from this conversation. We've got some really interesting speakers coming up. Uh, we'll also share with you some of the findings of the research project we're undertaking. Um, my name is Dan Langford. I'm a principal consultant at Urban Foresight. Where the UK's leading place based consultancy, uh, innovation consultancy. Proud to be working with Scottish Enterprise and Transport Scotland on this project, of which this webinar is part. Um, what do we have planned for you today? So we're at the introduction and overview right now. Um, moving on, we'll have a presenter from the supply side of. Uh, uh, the, the, the industry that we're, we're focusing on today. Um, this will be a, a speaker who's has worked across many industries, but now looking at um, the bicycle supply chain as well. Uh, we'll give you a bit of a summary then of the research project that we're undertaking on behalf of Transport Scotland and Scottish Enterprise, share with you some of the findings that we've come across over the last <laughs> few weeks since our first, um, since our first event. We'll then have uh, an OEM, a manufacturer on the demand side, to sort of talk about their experience in uh, uh, selecting their supply chain and uh, looking at some of the challenges that they've um, experienced over the last few years and currently. Uh, we'll then, then go through what's next and we'll be saving the Q&A for the end. So if you've got questions for any of our speakers, please do put them in the uh, Q&A box at the, well, wherever it is on your screen um, so that we can save those for the end. Uh, and then, we'll, yeah, as I said, talk about the, the next steps and, and what happens. A little bit of housekeeping. All attendees are currently muted. Um, please do introduce yourself in the chat window. As I mentioned, save the, the Q&A for the end, end, of the end of the session. We have plenty of time to, to round off any questions that you might have. And also, you would have been prompted at the start there, but the event has been is being recorded um and will be made available to the speakers at the end so so i'm getting ahead of myself here but recharge the chain it's just by way of a little bit of background most of this is covered in our first event a couple of weeks ago that is available on youtube so feel free to go watch that to get a little bit more detail about what our ambitions and goals are with this project but quickly, it's a research project aiming to evidence the local supply chain, uh, the capability and appetite for growth. We're also supply, exploring the opposite side of that, the um, how it complements the European market demand specifically. Uh, this intersection of supply and demand allows us to identify opportunities in the sector. And, and that's all we're aiming to do is you know, look at where those opportunities are for the supply chain and where the demand is going to be, or hopefully going to be over the next few years. Um, it's a, it's a two month long project. And as I said, this is the second in a series of three webinars where we're talking about our progress. Um, there'll be ample opportunity. I mean, you're as the, the audience and the industry are key to this. Uh, so we're definitely looking for feedback and, and uh, sharing your experience and knowledge of the industry is something we really look forward to. The main way of doing that is by looking at uh, by filling out our survey, which I think we'll be putting in the chat a couple of times during this event. So please take a look at that. Anyone who's wanting to have a more, <coughs> excuse me, in-depth discussion, please reach out to us to do that as well. Okay, so I guess the overall goal, the goal of this is Scottish Enterprise and Transport Scotland. and their motivation behind this project is to document and evidence um, that, inf that data and information will hopefully be the basis for future Scottish government investment in the sector. So without further ado, we'll move on to our first speaker of the day. Moving on the slides, which is Stuart Morrison, uh, Managing Director of MEP Technologies, who's gonna take a little bit of time to uh, talk about his company, um, their experience and, and the, the widgets that they make. 
uh, and providing a little bit of industry perspective and aspirations to be uh, a more significant supplier in the electric assisted vehicle um, and cycle supply chain. So Stuart, if I can hand it over to you. Yeah, remember to unmute. Hi everybody, um, I'll uh, stick my slides up now and I can uh, start to let you know who we are and what we've got going on. Oh, I need you to unshare, Dan, I think. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Share. Okay. Everybody see the screen? Good. Right. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know us, um, I, I'm the managing director of um, MEP Technologies. We are based at the Mitchell and Scotland Innovation Park in Dundee, and our life is all about battery systems. Um, from our point of view, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the different industries that we currently work in. Um, I'm in, in the middle of something. Sorry. Oh, no, you carry on. Sorry. Right. Uh, so, sorry, guys. Um, yeah, um, I'll go through some of the other industries we've been involved in, some of the experiences we've got, and um, and also talk about some of the products we've currently got. And hopefully um, it'll become self-evident where all that fits into the uh, supply chain for assisted vehicles and assisted um, uh, uh, bicycles. So a bit of background for us. Um, we uh, have been working with rechargeable battery packs for over three decades. We come from the automotive industry and e-mobility industry. And we now do uh, work also in what I call portable storage, which is basically any any application where a battery that can be removed from a pro an application can can be used we've been involved in the past as i say in the automotive industry and the majority of the team here at mep were involved with axiom technologies in developing the and manufacturing the battery that went into the mclaren p1 hypercar so um hopefully that um along with the the, the, the three decades that we've all been working on it demonstrates that we know batteries quite well by now. Um, we've got a 10, just over 10,000 square foot facility here at uh, the Mitchell and Scotland Innovation Park, and that supports our engineering design. Our, uh, we do cell and battery testing here, and of course, uh, battery manufacturing. Uh, being on the park, um, the green credentials um, uh, are, are evident. We've got two wind turbines on site that generate um, the electric power for the park. We also take our heat from the local waste to heat facility. And when we test batteries, when we discharge them, all the energy is put back onto the grid. So we are quite efficient in the way we, we go about our business. I'm the uh, managing director. Um, I've got 30 years of experience in the automotive and electronics industries. Uh, I've been managing new technologies for over 20 years now. I joined Axian in 2007, which was when I started working with batteries. And uh, my background is validation testing. So that carries over into the work we do now. Um, my, my colleague, Alice, Ali Loudon, he's um, our, our lead engineer, and he's got, again, um, 30 years of electronic systems experience. And we also um, have a software engineer, Andy White, who joined us in 2020, and again, over 30 years of experience in developing software for embedded systems. So getting straight now more to the important parts, uh, product lines. I, I've broken our product lines down into, into three areas. Uh, first area is what I call removable packs. And, and for the purposes of this chart, I've shown here what removable packs could be. So packs are typically standalone. Uh, they're either flying lead connections or a bespoke self-aligning um, insertion application where, where the connection's automatically made. Uh, we can supply battery packs in soft pack form, i.e. no external casing, or as you can see on the screen, we can um, fit them into bespoke cases where the case is either part of the frame of the, the application, the, the, the bicycle or the bike, or um, can be attached either on a rack or in, in bottle uh, battery type form. Um, the, the typical size of these packs are 400 watt hours to three kilowatt hours. Three kilowatt hours being approximately um, a 16, 17 kilograms. So it gets quite heavy uh, for being removable, but I think it's on the edge of what's possible. Um, we also have other product lines. Uh, so the, the, the bigger modules um, 
up to six point, this is a 6.4 kilowatt hour module you see at the bottom of the screen. And at the top right, there's a four kilowatt hour module. These are, are slightly larger battery, um, uh, for, for larger batteries. And they support vehicle manufacturers and converters to convert a electric vehicle or e-mobility type applications. Um, in terms of controlling the, the, the system, we have our own battery management system and uh, our battery management system can either be fitted into these modules, uh, so supporting it, and, and these modules can be stacked to either high capacity or high voltage. They can also support either air cooling or liquid cooling, depending on the application requirements. Um, some of the, the, the smaller applications tend to just re, uh, rely on uh, the cells being chosen correctly and passive cooling, but for some of the higher power applications, it's useful to have a bit of um, cooling support. And again, they're all, as I say, designed for either a standalone integration. So the, the pack that you can see in the top right hand corner, it goes into an agricultural um, application, a, a rotavator, a hand rotavator type application, and, and can work and function all by itself. Or as you can see in the, the, the middle of the bottom of the screen, our, our 6.4 kilowatt hour module can be stacked to make a, a, a larger entity uh, fitting inside a battery pack. So some of these are obviously quite useful uh, in terms of the building blocks that can be used for, for different types of applications. On this screen, I show that the two modules, the 2.2 and the four, um, as you can see on the four kilowatt hour on the left-hand side, uh, it, it fits itself into the application and it's designed for, for wire mount. And on the right-hand uh, image, these are 2.2 kilowatt hour blocks that are a standard VDE size. In, in the battery industry, it's a, a standardized, there's not many standards, but this is a standardized size of module that allows, again, vehicle developers and converters to, to pick something that's off the shelf from, um, I won't say any supplier, but from more than one supplier, allowing them to, to have multiple supply routes. Again, these, these components can either come with battery management system um, or not, or, or passive or liquid cooling. Um, interfacing on the, on the on cold plates, for example. Um, I'll, I'll quickly run through the rest of the slides and then come, come to the previous applications at the end. At our facility, we have a cell test lab to help us choose the, and test the right cells for the application. We have a battery prototyping facility, so our design team can work with um, 3D printers and local machine shops to create prototype battery systems for customers in, um, in a fairly short space of time. When we've got, uh, when we're able to choose a cell that we've got in stock, we can have prototypes um, ready for people within three to four weeks, which is um, <laughs> quite good. Quite good, I think. Uh, it's never fast enough though. Sometimes, um, so we have a design office where we have uh, ten people in the engineering team. Not a large team, but enough to do with the, uh, work with the projects we have. And as I mentioned, we have a production facility. Um, we've currently got some, some products going through the manufacturing line, but because we recently moved into this large space at the beginning of January, we have quite a bit of capacity now to, to, to fill with um, other battery applications. And just to give people an idea of the size, so our current facility can, can run 26,000 of those um, VDE sized two kilowatt hour modules uh, a year without, um, it, with, with the equipment we've got and the people we've currently got on site. Um, important things from an engineering point of view, uh, battery systems require uh, knowledge of joining technologies to make sure the cells are connected properly, cooling systems, which I've mentioned all the way through, and choosing lightweight materials that support the applications. Uh, we work with all sorts of cell chemistries and formats. Typically, a lot of our work these days is with the cylindrical cells, which most people who know battery systems will be um, knowledgeable of. 18650, we've used a lot of our, our battery packs now are used with our work um, made with 21700 cells. Um, but we can work with almost any format of cell. And um, we're also exploring some new chemistries. So sodium ions coming through. And we also are now on site have some lithium sulfur cells to test, which um, if I move on to the next slide, um, the typical cells we get um, on the market at the moment, I'll give you at the top there, lithium ion NMC, 252 watt hours per kilogram. Apologies for those people who are not in the know, but that's that's the sort of best on the market at the moment. Um, the lithium sulfur, which you see at the second bottom, is 350. So it promises a, a fairly significant step in terms of 
available energy, which for the applications means uh, longer distance or longer time between charges. Um, we have our own battery management system I mentioned earlier. This, this screen basically is a, a pitch to automotive applications because it mentions a lot of their typical um, protocols and, and um, a legislative requirements. Uh, we do a lot of our own validation testing, um, CFD and FEA, amongst others, to make sure the battery is designed correctly. All batteries go through UN for 8.3 testing to meet shipping requirements. And then we, we can conduct as much or as little further testing as necessary for the applications, abuse and safety, uh, and any other, as I say, legislative testing that's required. We are members of the UK Niche Vehicle Network. We also have strong links with the UK Battery Industrialization Centre. And we also work very closely with another company called Ampty Power. Uh, been in the news for um, expecting to, uh, to put a gigafactory or a megafactory, as it's now called, in, in the Dundee area, actually right next door to us um, in 2024. So that's, that's going to be uh, a, key, um, a key supplier for us in terms of um, unique um, uh, niche cells. Um, previous projects, this is the interesting part, I suppose, for some. Um, it, it gives us an idea of the scale of things that we work at from, from one end to the other. So this is a 54 kilowatt hour battery pack that goes into a Modec um, commercial vehicle. Key items, 54 kilowatt hours and a 1.4 tonne weight. Um, uh, we also did a, a battery for a classic mini retrofit, um, showing there the energy density is achieved at battery level. Um, that was a, a challenging one for packaging and, uh, and for power. We've done battery packs for light e-motorcycles in the past. Um, you can see on the screen there scooters and, and um, a, a five kilowatt hour um, hub motor based um, e-motorcycle. We've done work with subsea energy storage. We did a one-off proof of concept for subsea, so um, demonstrating that our batteries can be sealed to support um, sealing uh, beyond IP67K, which is what most of our batteries are for typical road applications. Low volume production, this is an example of one of the batteries that goes through our line. It's in the emergency services industry. We make 1800 of these a year, so it's not high volume, but it's, it's uh, significant. And it's a very high power battery pack that um, can be removed from the application. So you can see in the bottom right hand picture, there's a self-aligning uh, connector that um, is, is, is used in many different applications, but this, this one obviously is key. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, just some more headlines, so 10,000 square feet. We could support 100,000 of the smaller packs uh, on, on two shifts over the year. Uh, we expect to grow to 20,000 square foot in a, in a, within a couple of years. Uh, because we've got a lot of um, a lot of um, business coming in the pipeline. Um, another slide that just shows different cooling systems, not necessarily applicable to some of these applications. Um, Twenty-one seven hundred cells validation. That's the that's the different battery packs that we've got at the moment. I'm assuming the slides will be available after the show, so some of this might be useful reference points for people. And and that's me. Um, apologies, I kind of went very quickly there. There's lots of detail, but uh, happy to answer questions or uh, go into detail where required later on. No, thanks, Stuart. Um, oh, we could maybe just I didn't to cover. Sorry, I mean, Dan. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Dan. I didn't cover our ambitions. So, um, so we we obviously, as I say, do a lot of work in the automotive and e-mobility space. But clearly, there's a big market uh, for for niche e uh, e bicycle or 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 last mile vehicle delivery um, applications. And this is why it's, it's key. I'm keen for people to know who we are, what we can do, and maybe find a place where we can support uh, anyone's uh, applications in that space. Sorry, Dan. No, 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 that's, that's, that's great. Um, no, clearly you have the experience and obviously looking for that opportunity in, in the manufacturing of, I, I guess, the, the broad terminology that encompasses every sort of a electric supported uh, vehicle and, and bicycle, as it were, tricycle, cargo bike. Um, plenty of opportunities there. I mean, this whole project is about you know, exploring how where that industry is growing and how Scottish manufacturing can, um, yeah, jump in there and support that. Um, 
I did have a question I've just forgotten. Sorry, you talked about energy density there. I mean, do you yes. have you come across opportunities? Sorry, I'm jumping in early and asking a question, okay. but <laughs> we've got you here. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, I mean, is is there always a, generally an opportunity to improve upon, say, the battery pack that comes with a vehicle? Um, is that something you're, you're asked to do, you know, provide a, a, a higher density in the same form factor? Um, yeah, and so that, that's one thing. And the other one is to reduce size and weight, to give the same energy in, this, in, in a reduced size and weight footprint. So it, that happens. Um, we've only had a few inquiries like that so far um, because it's it, obviously it's a it's a time thing. I'm sure the the number of inquiries for that sort of um, activity will grow as yeah. as we go forward in time. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks a lot. Um, we will sure. say if anyone has any questions, again, put them in the chat. We will we'll try and save them to the end. So hopefully you can hang around for a little bit, Stuart, and we'll uh, get some of those questions answered. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Now I'll try sharing my screen again. Let me move this forward, or at least try to. Sorry, just skipping through all your slides quickly. There is one thing um, off the back of this, the battery discussion that, that Stuart's just been talking about. Um, there is one aspect I guess I've recently come across as, as a part of this research around um, the, this industry, and that's the, the concept that is, and a very common in the automotive industry is, is the right to repair. And as it says there on the screen, it's this concept is basically the yeah, right for the consumers to you know be able to repair their own electronic devices. Uh, it applies to everything from refrigerators and washing machines through to your mobile phones. Um, but just interestingly, late last year, specifically around batteries, um, the European Union has started introducing, I guess, regulations that come in force in 2026 that basically require all batteries to be replaceable. Um, and you you might remember the days when your mobile phone used to be able to replace the battery and buy, you know, two or three of them <laughs> rather than having to charge and rely on the existing one. So as of 2026 or soon thereafter, um, that will become a reality again. But, you know, applying this and thinking about, you know, the electrification of bikes, for example, uh, this becomes really interesting. I, I think cyclists or avid cyclists generally and historically have been tinkerers at heart you know you've always been able to swap out components you've always been able to do your own maintenance your own repairs and, and improvements on bikes um so the advent of electrification and the motors and batteries that 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 ability is sort of retrogressed a little bit if that's a word i think i might have just made it up but um you know the ability to do that has all of a sudden become limited from my understanding, currently, um, I think Bosch is probably the dominant motor provider um, in the industry, and you can't, you can't. Uh, as far as correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, but uh, my understanding is for the majority of their motors, you actually have to use Bosch batteries. Uh, you don't have another option. So that that reign of sort of control and plans, what potentially is planned obsolescence of your bike. Um, yeah, is about to end, meaning that it kind of opens up the market a little bit for, you know, third party aftermarket batteries that may have superior performance or, you know, storage beyond what the manufacturer provides. So I just thought I'd sort of highlight this, these right to repair regulations that are coming into force, which will you know, dramatically change the way batteries um, are provided in bikes specifically. Unfortunately, it's, yeah, not a priority in the UK. Uh, I guess we'd like to see the regulations um, be, or parallel regulations sort of um, effectively achieving the same goals, but it doesn't look like there's anything currently in place. Um, and, and of course, with those European ones, price is not addressed um, because it is largely requiring manufacturers to make parts available for extended period, you know, beyond the lifespan of vehicles. Uh, so it doesn't actually, you know, they, they could charge exorbitant fees for that. But, but I think, as I was saying, the most interesting thing I find about this is it does open up the market for third party replacements um, and those aftermarket opportunities to both repair and enhance the performance of, of electrified um, bicycles and other, other types of vehicles. So moving on to our next speakers. 
we're going to now discuss a little bit where we are in the research that we've been undertaking since our since we started the project about six weeks ago now. So my colleagues Anne Sophie Roy and Piot Mazur um, are senior consultants here at Urban Foresight, and we'll now take a few minutes to dig into um, yeah the, the the work they've been doing and share with you some of the insight that we've uncovered. Piot and Sophie, over to you. I will drive slides. And Sophie, you come first. Yep, I'm going Fantastic. first. Thank you, Dan. Um, so actually, before I move on to some of our key findings, I would like you uh, attendees to um, contribute and we, I we would like to have your thoughts on what you think are the barriers and opportunities related to uh, the Scottish EPAC, so Electric Power Assisted um, Cycles. Um, so feel free to pop in the chat any thought you may have on what you think the buyers and opportunities could be um, for the EPAC sector in Scotland. And before we move to that slide, can you go back to the other one, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you a few minutes to pop in any thought you may have. And uh, if necessary, Lauren can unmute you so you can elaborate on it. So I'll just wait a couple of minutes so everyone can participate. So, and so if you just uh, maybe clarify, you're looking for people to maybe share some of the barriers and opportunities they're yes. perceiving in their experience in the market? That's right. Okay. Um, but maybe sort of just we, going through a few slides and then circling back to get yeah, I think back on that. You're right. You can, you, we, we can do that. Um, it's fine. We can go back to this at the end of uh, our section. Um, so, yeah, can you go to the next slide, yep. please? So this, these are some of the barriers and opportunities that we have identified as part of the, of the research and also uh, from our engagement with um, industry stakeholders. So on the barrier side, we have um, the cost to cons cost consumers, sorry, because uh, as you are very likely aware of it, uh, EPACs are su substantially higher, um, like more costly than uh, conventional bikes. Uh, we also have barriers related to age requirements because we you need to be over 14 to ride uh, an e-bike. Uh, so the market is basically not there for the younger demographic. Um, we also have uh, growth and ambition, growth, ambition and capability because as part of our engagement with some of the stakeholders, we have identified that some uh, small companies in the sector are not necessarily ambitious to grow, uh, which is not necessarily a problem, but this is something we have observed. Uh, and there is also a lot of um, small traditional bike OEMs rather than large companies in Europe. Uh, obviously, it would be wrong to not mention Brexit uh, because new charges could be could make exporting e-bikes uh, a problem. It could be... It, expensive for UK companies to export bikes. And lastly, we have a, sh a short-term market downturn, because uh, again, this was according to a certain um, organization that we spoke to during our engagement that uh, there has been some kind of uh, over over-ordering during the COVID phase, um, which might uh, impact uh, the growth of the market in the short term. Uh, as for opportunities, uh, we have like a, a wider supply chain in Scotland because uh, we have like knowledge and components from other sectors that can be transferred to EPACs, such as like um, the e electric vehicles or the conventional bikes or the automobile manufacturing and so on. So all of these capabilities and knowledge could be used for um, the bike sector. Um, there is also skills and knowledge to build on because for example, Scotland already has the Mountain Bike Innovation Centre and we, Scotland could continue uh, to lead the UK uh, by 
in bike innovation. Um, we also have governmental focus and vision in Scotland, uh, increasing sales and demand for the long term, because um, again, according to some of the stakeholders we spoke to, uh, the prognosis for the e-bike market, market is the steady growth. Uh, there is a rise in demand for e-bikes that may also uh, generate demand for higher quality bike locks. So that's another um, growth opportunity for the market. And lastly, we also identified some of some struggles related to um, the supply of certain components from other parts of the world, especially from Asia. So this could be the opportunity for Scotland to fill in that gap. Um, I see that some of you have put something in the chat. Let me just have a look. So Chris Deverson, you've mentioned that for suppliers, a vision of the long-term opportunity available would be helpful. Uh, building the long-term relationship rather than focus on profit initially. Uh, Lorraine, maybe can you unmute Chris if Chris is happy to share uh, and elaborate more on this? Is this something we can do? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it's, yep. I'll go for it a little bit in my, in my slides later, but um, we found that sort of suppliers give you the typical, here's the price for the part you've, you want, rather than going, okay, how can we make this cheaper? How can we work together and, and sort of build that longer term um, picture of, of where we can go with production? Very good, thank you. Um, I think Jerry Lawson is also once also wants to speak. Lauren, can you unmute him? That puts me on the spot. I wasn't quite expecting <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> I was typing. Um, so one of the things we've identified is the barriers of manufacturers to change their manufacturing to an alternative product. Um, it's that cost element, which is not even to the consumers, it's to the manufacturer to change. Very good, thank you. And lastly, I think we have Ken Hoskins. If you're happy to share also some of your thoughts, sorry to put you on the spot as well. Yeah. That's fine, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, a couple of barriers, some of the folks probably have already heard me say these before. One is in terms of government support for employers leasing e-bikes versus uh, purchase. Um, the schemes, you know, out there for, for purchasing, but not for leasing, and that seems to be contrary to the circular economy. We're encouraging people to actually lease products, not actually own them. And the other barrier that we've come across is for the enterprise investment scheme for investors, uh, which has tax advantages for investors. Um, HMRC uh, doesn't recognise uh, eligibility if you rent or lease your your bikes out to the uh, to employers or go public. And um, that's a situation we happen to face, but uh, it does seem a bit strange. It does, contrary to the kind of initiative to encourage uh, uptake of e bike mm -hmm. schemes. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, that's really helpful. Uh, that will definitely feed into uh, our research. Um, Sorry, so Anne Sophie, I was just going to jump in quickly. It yeah. might be worth hearing from Moira about her line of sight comment. Um, I, I think I've, in our conversations, we have actually come across this as well. Um, Moira, I don't know if you want to explain that a bit more. Actually, it might have been with Stuart from MEP, sort of the visibility of, you know, what the market opportunity actually is for his batteries um, is, is kind of a gap that, that exists currently. Moira, do you want to expand upon your, your comment there? Apologies, I'm struggling to unmute myself. Um, yeah, no, it was just to say that um, something that we hear quite a lot from businesses is that who are in one sector and trying to diversify into another sector is that you need to have line of sight to volume customer orders. You can't, and just as, just as um, Ken was saying and Chris was saying and Stuart was saying, the, the cost of, and for Jerry as well, the cost of changing manufacture into a new sector is quite significant, particularly, you know, today's kind of current market prices. So that investment has to be de-risked by getting line of sight to 
volume orders from customers. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here where the customers haven't got line of sight to the suppliers, the suppliers haven't got line of sight to the customers. So how do we take that barrier away? Fantastic. Sorry for butting in and Sophie, back to you. No worries. Thanks, Mara. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm actually done with my section, so I will let Piotr uh, continue this presentation. Great. Thanks very much, Sophie. And thanks, Lorraine, for making it look so seamless to unmute everybody. I know it's not. <laughs> uh, so uh, our research sort of led us to exploring the concept of bike valleys in Europe. So this next little section will sort of compare two of them, uh, two of the more, most prominent ones. So one in Belgium and one in Portugal to see how they developed and what strengths they have. And we've done this for our study to see how the Scottish sector might develop in the future if it adopts uh, this model, um, which is basically an industry cluster, which uh, has potential to address some of the barriers that we just talked about, especially around reliability and the supply chain. So uh, the first one, is Portugal. So right now, sorry about the slightly out of graph. Uh, now we know that Portugal is the li largest bicycle manufacturer by some margin in Europe. Um, it's over 3 million now rather than 2.6, 2.5 that the graph shows. Uh, so it is kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing how quickly it's developed. Uh, 20 years ago, as it says, uh, it was only 400,000 bikes that were manufactured in Portugal. Um, and today, the country, which actually is only 2% of the EU population, is responsible for over 20% of all bicycle production in Europe, which is amazing. Um, and the development is a result of uh, multiple factors. So, you know, the EU's policies, uh, Portuguese government's focus on this were definitely a factor. Uh, factors in making this success but above all it's uh, the continuous investment um, and that sort of long-term investment that was the case that made it happen uh, so it's centered around the region of Agueda in Portugal uh, which is just south of Porto uh, and that region was a has a really hit, rich history of manufacturing and of industry it was a center for metalworking and in 1922 a uh, first bike factory opened uh, and actually, just after the Second World War, the whole concept of Bike Valley uh, started. Uh, and the, the, the area became interesting for international companies to invest in, especially British brands, interesting enough, uh, who appreciated the know-how and the favorable production conditions they found here. So you can see that it's going back quite a number of years in that region. Uh, obviously, in the 1980s, like everywhere, we've experienced offshoring to Asia, which very much impacted the growth of the sector. Uh, and that was due to costs, uh, quite plainly. And the negative trends reversed after the 2008 crisis. We all know that Portugal was affected quite badly, but in terms of the bike valley, it actually was an opportunity for them to capitalize on the lower labor costs and on the know-how and the quality of the parts. Uh, right now, it, actually the area employs about 25,000 people, uh, which is, not insignificant for a country of Portugal size. And there's over 60 companies in the region around Agueda that can be classified as belonging to the bicycle industries. Um, so 8,000 people are employed directly by those companies, but about 25,000 the uh, the wider supply chain. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. So. The area is a major manufacturing hub for foreign OEMs right now. There are a number of local OEMs, but they're not the focus of what's happening there. Uh, there is, it, it focuses on speed, reliability, and flexibility of, uh, of the supply chain and of the manufacturing process. And due to having a large number of supply chain uh, players in the area, you know, it's less affected by the supply chain issues. Uh, which are experienced elsewhere in the world uh, and is very responsive to demands as the suppliers are able to fulfill the demand locally and able to respond to what's in demand uh, at any given moment. Uh, again, we mentioned, Bre and Sophie mentioned Brexit, and I know uh, we've heard it all the time in our engagement. You know, it has access to a large internal EU market, which Scotland would not necessarily have. So that's a big uh, bonus for 
<laughs> for the Portuguese bike sector. Uh, and actually the recent disruption to the supply chains due to Brexit and due to COVID especially has been a major boost for the region uh, as the supply chain is responsive and is able to feel, fulfill the demand and the region has the know-how to take advantage of the opportunity. So that's why it's grown so quickly. So uh, in, the in the last three years, the exports there grew by a whopping 49%. And right now it's just shy of 200, uh, 600, sorry, 600 million euros per annum. Uh, and up until now, it has been mostly assembly and sort of uh, not very innovative manufacturing, but uh, there has been steady and re reinforced investment in R&D right now in the region. They don't want to just become the new China due to, or the new Taiwan due to lower labor costs but they want to be able to make all components locally, make innovation happen uh, and just become an innovative player, not just an assembly line. If we could have the next slide, please, Dan. Uh, so these are some, some, of the, uh, some of the things that the bike value or bike value, as they like to be called, uh, focus on. So they focus on uh, the territory. So support for business installation, territorial information, business information, you know, the supply chain. They also have a technological center, uh, which focuses on testing and certification. They have some research funding, but as I say, until now that has not been the focus of it, but they have had, they have got partnerships with universities and with research facilities. They also focus on promotion, especially around sports. Uh, and they do have good supportive laws and policies uh, from local and central governments. Uh, that strengthen the role of the bike sector uh, within the Portuguese economy. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, as well. Uh, so this is just a list of uh, assembly and component manufacturers uh, within the region. So we see familiar players, but we also see a lot of local companies. So it just, uh, just illustrates a number of players that uh, are within the area, which is which is quite major. Uh, so uh, that's Portugal. Now, in contrast, if uh, we can talk about the Flanders bike, uh, bike valley in Belgium. So uh, in Portugal, the bike valley is more of a concept rather than physical space. Uh, in, flat, in, in Belgium, it is very much a building that it all started in and it is far more recent. So it started in 2013 by only three companies. Uh, and the actual remit of it was very narrow it was to undertake aerodynamics testing and create a wind tunnel for testing so we can see that the idea was very specific rather than uh, creating a wider industry cluster however it's grown quite quickly since then so right now it's got 50 members from really various sectors so uh, it includes electronics design ict and healthcare so how it has developed it's become an industry cluster uh, for the bike industry, but not only for the bike industry. Uh, and it has very much become a research-led uh, facility rather than a manufacturing one. Uh, if I could have the next slide, I think that's the final one. There you go. So yeah, it focuses on innovation and collaboration. And the fact that it's centered around one building lends itself to uh, having a very big networking uh, component. So it's called Bikeville, and that includes education facilities, R&D facilities, testing, including the wind tunnel. It has office spaces that uh, is made available for companies that want to contribute to it, as well as collaboration spaces, event spaces. Uh, even has a restaurant, which is uh, interesting. And it has a store as well that allows consumers to directly test some of the ideas that the R&D companies are developing. And it's actually become a hub for not just Belgium, but also for the Dutch and German cycling industries. And a lot of Dutch and German companies uh, have established themselves within the within Bikeville. And it's helped obtain further funding for research. And in the spirit of branching out from bikes, actually uh, created uh, a new space, not just for mountain biking, but also for other sports uh, like slopes, tracks, swimming pools, you know, there's a diving tire climbing facility. So it sort of reinforces the the difference that the Portuguese sector is so solely focused on the bike industry, whereas the Belgian one, uh, Belgian one looks at the wider industry and see how that can be 
uh, helped through the lens of uh, e-bikes mainly. So those are the two countries that had very different approaches to grow their e-bike or bike sector. Uh, and we just thought they can provide an insight into what Scotland might be able to achieve should it adopt a bike valley concept. Um, so that's that's it from me. I think it's back to you, Dan. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, uh, Piotr and Sophie. Uh, Thank you. It's really useful just getting that sort of compare and contrast of, of what's happening, um, as well as the sort of capabilities and challenges that we might be looking at um, both locally and across Europe there. So moving on, or attempting to move on to our next speaker, we have uh, Chris Deverson, who spoke a little bit a moment ago as well, but he's the technical and production manager at Deviate Cycles. Um, Chris is going to provide a bit of a background on the company and the products that they provide, as well as some insight into maybe procurement decisions, uh, some perspective on future direction of, of the company and industry as a whole. Um, so over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, if I can take control, please. No. Yep. I'll stop sharing. Um, can you see this? It's come through. There we go. Sorry. Oh, good. Um, sorry, do you mind bringing your size up? I can't get it. Work. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'm happy to drive. Cool. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, no problem. So yes, uh, we are Deviate Cycles. Um, we established about five years ago. And as you can see here, this is our, our first little proper um, bike we produced that's been successful for the last sort of four years or so. Um, uh, but yes, we're predominantly in mountain bikes. So if you come to the next slide, please. So who are we? We are very much a sort of niche high-end mountain bike brand. Um, we produce pretty much all our frames in Asia um, through an established supply chain there um, using parts from China and from, and from Taiwan, um, where they kind of have a real good handle of the quality you're expecting and they can generally turn out, yeah, good quality bikes at the price point that we that works for us. Um, where we can, we do try and use a UK supply chain. Uh, we have sort of machine parts come from from England, and um, which we try and sort of reach out to local suppliers. But uh, and as I said before, uh, it does turn to a bit of a struggle. Um, so this year we just hit 1.4 million turnover, which is a big step for us. We've Kind of growing and on the sort of trajectory um, of sort of strong growth and we're sort of building that dealer network where we're selling into pretty much all around the world um every i think every continent is covered now um but our biggest markets are in in germany and north america where we sell about 30 percent into germany about 30 percent into north america um but Obviously, Brexit, as, as, as we mentioned already, uh, it's really hurt our direct sales. So it basically fell off a cliff on, on Brexit day. Um, and direct sales are really where we make a good, a good solid margin and we can sort of really then sort of grow from there. But we're starting to establish a, a dealership network now. And um, that's also has challenges with exporting um, into Germany and into, into Europe, where we're getting double hit on duty. Um, and it's often delays in um, sat in a warehouse somewhere in, in Europe. Um, so yeah, it can lead to frustrations there. Uh, obviously, as people know, during COVID, we were hit by this sort of um, long lead time. So our lead time for samples went from six months to about 18 months. Um, and then once production is up and running, it's this high freight cost, um, which just yeah, just adds to your sort of, uh, your sort of unit cost really. And, um, yeah, have a little margin to play with. Um, so during a, a sort of a completion of a product, we got hit with longer lead time and we were like, well, can we do it quicker here? Can we be more, more flexible here and, and build something in the UK? And we approached suppliers um, who you know, from motorsport sectors and, and um, automotive composite section sectors, but uh, 
it came back with a sort of the, the high cost and it's just, it's really hard to swallow at the sort of the stage of business we're in um so we did some in-house testing we did some component testing and, and lay up um sort of ideas basically tried some ideas out and uh it kind of came around to this sort of question of like is this really the right thing for us you know it's still going to take someone 10 hours to lay up a frame in, in pre-preg uh, carbon fiber um and it's, it's gonna be the same in asia so we're always gonna have this kind of matched pricing where we're going to be you know 50 more expensive than china so it kind of made us think you guys the next slide please um like can we rethink what we're our approach is to to manufacture and yeah just start again in terms of like what's the best materials what's the um what's the best process here so also in, in my mind is the sustainability of, of um carbon prepreg um it's a thermoset so it's it's quite hard to recycle and it's always it's, it's five years away we can recycle it but uh i've still not seen results for the last 15 years um so personally i was i sort of have a young family and i was kind of thinking in the future like do my kids want to take on my business and sort of be proud of dad for doing the best thing you could with the information he had at the time um and yeah i want to try and achieve that um and also customer attitude is changing as well um we're seeing customers questioning where our stuff's coming from uh when sustainable materials come out that they're, they're talking about more about aluminium now and recyclability of titanium etc so it's really on our sort of radar of like we need to be actioning this and and responding um also thinking about that while we're on this sort of like blank canvas of what's the best option here um we looked at repairability can we have a system where we can repair parts of the bike uh also can we take a bike back at the end of its life and chop it up and make it into something else um and recycling is obviously the sort of one to aim for but repurposing i think is is still a step in the right direction um so you know, it's a typical sort of aluminium titaniums and, and sort of even looks at thermoplastic composites um, as a sort of more durable material and um the opportunity to reprocess uh so yes yeah, so as from that we basically started looking into new manufacturing processes and um we've done some quite interesting projects uh which i can't really talk about too much at the moment because they're sort of quite uh early days for us but um we wouldn't be able to do these projects without the support from scottish enterprise and the innovate edge funds um it kind of allows us to really sort of see where, where we can uh where we can go with them really um there's still gaps in the technology uh and, and our knowledge and it might take a couple of years to, to fill those gaps and uh and our, our time and effort and our, our sort of investment in that r d but uh we're keen and we have we have concepts to sort of overcome those challenges uh and around that we sort of need to build a supply chain uh which we you know we have machine shops in, in england we use which are very much like lights out and they can produce to our demand but um that's only one supplier i've really engaged and um they seem to get it um so yeah keen to sort of re hear reach out and see what other, other people can offer uh, next slide please uh so get often question of why scotland uh also don't sound very scottish uh but uh it was a decision we made uh six years ago now and um we, we love scotland uh it's got the best riding in the world out there it's um it's rocky it's it's muddy it's um pretty rugged and it's the best place to test our bikes um there's a saying if it works in scotland it will work anywhere so it's kind of it's a real testament to our i think our design for our bikes but also the durability of them uh scotland also has sort of closer political ties i think with the eu and more probably more alignment um and there's just this nice atmosphere when, when you talk to um, the sort of team at Scottish Enterprise and they seem to be very excited about what we're doing. And um, I think in England, it's not so not so seen and sort of recognised um, as it is here. So it's good. And also that there's a sort of funding support, which 
is a little bit easier to access um, without having to spend days filling out um, sort of Innovate Edge forms and Innovate UK forms. So yeah, it's just really quite exciting for us to be here. Uh, next slide, please. So our next steps, um, we're just putting together a plan for the next sort of two years from taking our concepts and sort of our proof of concepts into production. And that's basically trying to you know, bring in automation, that's um, trying to make our components more consistently and to go for the testing that we need to do to sort of bring a bike into the market. Uh, and it's, as I said just now, it's kind of building a supply chain who can see it as a longer term gain for them. Um, often, like I said, we get quotes, which is just, they don't really think about, oh, how can we save our customer money? It's like, how can we sort of work with them to, to build a sort of a, a longer term relationship? And um, that's really key for us because we're quite loyal as, as people we make decisions based on relationships. So yeah, I think that's really important. Um, uh, so financial support as well. Uh, we don't want to go to the begging bowl, but like um, all our cash at the moment is sort of tied up in, in sort of growing the brand and sort of using the Asian production to grow our business and, and uh, show how we can be innovative in the industry. Um, but we need support to sort of do this R&D projects and um, really give some time and effort to make that happen. Uh, and at the moment, as it stands, I'm pretty much the only technical part of the business. And uh, so I'm doing all the Asian production, all the design and trying to do the R&D as well. So it's a bit of a stretch for me at the moment, but um, yeah, uh, help doing grant applications, you know, these sort of things that just don't have time for it. I'm just, just so busy with other things. So. Yeah, quite a stretched uh, team here. Quite, a, yeah. That's that's it, for me. So, any any sort of um, questions come later. But uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. I wonder if it's uh, people are probably interested to go and look at your website, but maybe you want to just give a quick overview of of, of your bike, I guess, and why it's why it's a little bit different than um, your your average bike. Yeah, so it's, it's typically not. It's obviously not a road bike or a. Um, a commuter vehicle, but um, it's you know, looking at about a three thousand pound frame, uh, which is kind of it's competitive. I say in, in our in our part of the market, uh, but it's it's a mountain bike and it's designed for sort of racing or um, spending days in the hills in, in Cairngorms. And uh, but where we have sort of I guess our USPs are the suspension design and the way it's been sealed sealed from the elements. So all our pivots and moving parts are well sealed and they have grease ports and it's kind of going back to the drawing board a little bit in terms of how we design our bikes um, but yeah at the moment we're sort of, we do have projects doing uh, electric bikes which have again be electric mountain bikes but uh, you know we're sort of trying to expand our range a little bit good good so you I mean you talked about your turnover but sort of how many how many bikes are you building a year currently or, or planning to uh, about a thousand a year okay great um uh sorry i don't know if i'm digging into too much detail so so i guess locally are, are you really doing sort of the assembly side of things yeah uh just to get more I, I guess proportionally you know what what is there anything being made locally or is it you know largely just assembly and, and distribution it's, it's just assembly and distribution really uh we yeah just for quality purposes we get the sort of the raw carbon parts or sort of painted carbon parts here and we assemble the linkages all the bolts and uh sort of seals go together here just so we can get hands on and touch and feel every part of it um we've tried in asia to do assembly but they don't really understand the seals and how the intricacies of the design work so uh yeah we just that's how we've, we've sort of geared up at the moment fantastic well i mean we are getting into the q a section so if anyone else has more questions um if Uh, Stuart, if you could potentially expand upon the question you answered in the chat there about the the recycling and and um, you know the, I guess the
I think you're back now, Dan. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. No idea what happened there. <laughs> Looks like we were lost. No, no, everyone's back now. Um, sorry, I'll share my screen again. Car, when you are going to ask Stuart a couple of questions, just to let you know. So, everyone might be a moment. Okay, it is sharing the right screen. Okay. Um, what was I asking, Stuart? Um, sorry, it was in the chat, the questions around standardization, I think Moira was um, asking. Oh, no, sorry, it wasn't. Um, sorry, is Stuart still online? No, that's what I was saying. Yeah, uh, I'm still here. Oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't yeah. know if you'd expand upon the recyclability and what happens to batteries sort of after they... Uh, I guess leave your doorstep there. I know Moira asked a que or someone asked a question earlier in the conversation there. Um, yeah. Would you have to expand on, on that a little bit? Yeah, I'll stay off video at the moment though. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. We we, um, we currently uh, when we we have batteries coming back to us, we dismantle them and put them back through the the, the recycling route. So as a company we use over in um, Glasgow, uh, we recycling. Um, and the, the cells go off to Europe um, to be recycled. So it'd be nice to, to, get, to make that something a bit more local, but I think we need to wait for the, the industry to grow a little before we look at more, you know, more sustainable ways of recycling batteries. The other shame, I suppose, is that some of the cells may not have reached end of life. Um, however, finding a market for a battery that's been made with used cells is difficult at the moment ha happy to get involved in that but i haven't found a customer yet who's happy to take <laughs> secondhand cells into a battery pack uh, and get and, and give it a warranty to end customers yeah i guess there's there's always that promise of there being a market out there but identifying exactly where it is and who it is is is, is, is the challenge yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. But you know, if, if if somebody if somebody can point me to it, I'm happy to get involved in it because I, I like the idea of being able to 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 keep things going that haven't reached their end of life. Yeah, yeah. No, that that totally makes sense. Um, I, I I don't know why. I, I think there's I have a suspicion there's a team at Scottish Enterprise that might be able to help out with that. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. Maybe Moira knows something more there, but I'm sure we'll be able to track that down and, and point you in the right direction there. Um, all right, there's also a question that came in for Chris around standardization of componentry um, and the possibility of new manufacturing process. Again, that was Moira. I don't know if Moira, if you want to come on and ask that question, maybe and clarify what, what you're asking there. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting in a, little, a bit myself, Dan. I don't know whether there's maybe a, a Zoom problem this morning. Um, so was that a question about manufacturing or was it a question about the recycling or? Oh, sorry. No, I guess there was a couple of questions there. Mm -hmm. Stuart was asking about sort of the circular economy side of things yeah. and, and who might be worth engaging to understand more about, you know, what the potential for reusing batteries might be. Yeah. Is there any support you're aware of from um, Scottish Enterprise, for example? Yeah, I mean, we do have a team um, in SE and SDI that are looking at the battery sector. Obviously, sure, it'll be connected into some of them, like Susano here. Um, and yeah. I totally echo what you said. There needs to be a volume out there. So, again, it's almost a bit like a chicken and egg situation. You can't look at the re remanufacture recycling until you've got kind of volume customers out there. So we need to look at building the Scottish capability whilst looking at the next future market and kind of trying to obviously de-risk that kind of relationship if that makes sense so yeah. yeah Stuart just get in touch and if you haven't spoken to Suzanne already then um, she's our she's our battery guru at the moment yeah I think I spoke to Suzanne about two and a half years ago so it's probably time to re reacquaint might be worth having a catch up absolutely yeah. I think it'd be good yeah. for her to know where, where you are as well in terms of sure. your, your goals yeah okay. I appreciate that thanks Moira mm -hmm. 
And Moira, you asked a question about standardization of componentry, Chris. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of back to the point, just to kind of elaborate a little bit. Um, and I'd be interested to kind of get um, Jerry's thoughts on this, because I know Jerry's on the call as well, um, about standardization of parts, because one of the things that's difficult for manufacturers in the UK is to manufacture lots of different sizes of standard parts, if that makes sense. So looking at chain guards and derailers and things like that. So is there an opportunity because we can't manufacture necessarily like for like for all the components on a bike or a, an electric pedal assist vehicle is there an opportunity for us to look at standardizing parts and do you, do you think the industry would be open to that oh that puts me on the spot again fine yes yeah, so the answer is lots of standardized parts um cables discs um there'll be lots of things that do work um, this is when we wave our flag and what makes us different as a kids bike manufacturer is we look at kids differently so um, things like crank length do change because of the size of the rider um, but other parts tires treads can be the same um, spokes just need to be cut to the right length so that lots of things can be standardized um, some manufacturers like to have their own uh, patent on it, but even if it's doing the same job, I don't know if that's really necessary. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, I don't know, Chris, if you want to add anything. Uh, sure, yeah, we're quite uh, in a sort of niche market, I guess, so um, people love to tweak and sort of uh, add their own touch to their bikes, so standard, standards in the mountain bike world is, uh, is a big topic, and it's, it seems to not get traction very far, and it's um, Never really had taken off. Got it. So that's a more of a consumer demand. Very much so, yeah. Yeah. Type thing. And yeah, it's all about customization and having that's what I was saying before, right? About the, generally your average cyclists are all about tweaking, maintaining, enhancing um, whatever they can on, on their bikes. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. No real, real surprise there. Uh just trying to see spot any other questions in there. Um so I don't, know, I don't know if any of the other presenters saw any other questions but if there's any more that are coming to people's minds please do ask them oh i guess Sorry, there's, there's one here that, yeah, sh uh, towards Stuart as well. I mean, just so from your battery supply side of things, uh, what kind of, what, what is your, I mean, are you hitting any supply challenges as well um, with regard to your battery packs that might be, you know, similar or related to the bike industry? Um, the, believe it or not, we, we suffer from the chip shortage problem. So for our battery management systems, um, we are finding it difficult to get processors. <laughs> And some of the uh, standard battery management system chips. Cell wise, we have uh, so two, two, and a, two and a bit years ago, we were 100% Samsung cells. And a, presumably because the automotive industry starts sucking up lots of Samsung, you know, raw materials into cells for Volkswagen, for example, we, we found the supply chain for cells became extremely constrained. So what we've done uh, is to align ourselves with some lesser known cell manufacturers that we've spent a year or two qualifying. So we can be pretty sure that what we've got is a, a, a TS or ISO 9001 accredited cell supplier who not only has, has good processes and been through a, a sort of a QA um, process with us, but we've also uh, physically tested those cells to ensure that they provide as good as, or in some cases, better than performance and life than, than Samsung cells, which we always held to be one of the best on the market. So we've, we've, we've done that to mitigate supply issues and sales themselves, but electronics wise, we've, we're still struggling with that one. Yeah, no, actually it mirrors a discussion I had with a bike manufacturer a few weeks ago. I might've mentioned it previously, but yeah, they, they, they said the delay on the bikes was actually the, the battery packs and the motors, but it, it, specifically it was the chips <laughs> that yeah. goes into those devices that was yeah. actually causing the delays. So Yeah, so, so uh, what, what, it, what it actually means for us, Dan, is we, we end up having to put more money into cash flow because we buy 
a long time ahead of when we actually need components for our production. Uh, so we end up with sitting on lots and lots of stock to make sure that we don't end up with a hole in our supply chain. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like for other players, especially in the bike industry, that has been, I uh, can't remember who mentioned it, but um, it's been detrimental to their business in the end. They've ended up with way too much stock and the demand dropped off. Um, so clearly caused problems for, for particular yeah. businesses. Yeah, we got to live in hope on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, chips are, I guess, um, I don't know, maybe they're, uh, hopefully they're not the most expensive component of, of, of what you're putting together there. Um, yeah. Possibly could be. Uh, just yeah. trying to look at these other questions here. I, I think, yeah, Ken mentioned this, the, the challenges around the enterprise investment scheme, not allowing business to lease or rent out their e-bikes. Um, I have seen just in the last couple of days, actually, that there are definitely businesses growing in this area from a financial perspective. Um, so it doesn't address that problem with the investment scheme, but um, businesses capitalizing on or gaining significant investment who are um, looking at renting and leasing bikes to fleets, um, primarily looking at, I think they call them utility bikes. So everything from cargo bikes and trailers um yeah that, that seems to be a very fast growing area um recently was even speaking to a, a a bike maintenance company here in dundee who is looking at, at setting up their own leasing program for that that same reason so it's clearly a growing area so hopefully the you know the schemes like the one you mentioned catch up um and do recognize that that could be the future of you know how people are, uh, are taking on these bikes especially for businesses that are taking on small fleets um of vehicles because that that expense becomes fairly significant uh and i guess any last call for for, for questions otherwise we'll wrap up shortly we'll keep an eye on the, the the questions there but i'll just move on to our oh that's me i think moira had a question moira? Uh, no, oh, no it was ken it was ken to moira sorry okay um, well, thank you very much for, for being here today. Thanks to all our speakers, attendees, um, Scottish Enterprise and Transport Scotland for coming along today. As I mentioned multiple times, this is the second in a series of three. Our last event will be on Tuesday, 18th of April. So please, uh, please register for that. Hopefully we can throw the link in the chat there to register for the third event. What we'll be doing there is talking about all the, the, the outcomes of the research that we've been conducting and um, talk about sort of the conclusions that we've come to, uh, discussing the capability and appetite here in Scotland against that back, backdrop of the global market demand and opportunity. Uh, we'll have some more presenters talking about their, their experience in the industry. Um, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, our survey to gather information about your perspective and understanding and experience in the industry is still open. So please uh, fill out our survey, um, sing it from the rooftops, share it with all your friends. Um, we want as much input as we can on that. Uh, as I mentioned, oh, sorry, Joe, Jerry, valid question. I think we might have the link to the YouTube recording of the first event. Um, which good segue. So this, as this is being recorded, we will share it uh, with everyone uh, shortly after the event. So I guess after today, you'll be able to watch the first and second one as it, as it leads up to the third event on the 18th of April, Tuesday, 18th of April, same time, 11 a.m. I will just wait until, oh, no, okay. So it looks, sounds like we're gonna send out the link to the YouTube, previous YouTube event. Um, so we'll have both of those go out to all the attendees, along with the link to this one. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, look forward to seeing you again all at the next event. Um, yeah, please uh, alert any other uh, attendees to come along. As I said, share the survey broadly. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Dan, everyone.